Today we're talking about abstraction, abstract data types, and opaque types in C. Hey everybody, welcome back. So I was recently working on a video about testing, unit testing specifically, and this isn't it, but it's coming, don't worry, it's coming in about a week. But testing got me thinking about abstraction and some things that new programmers and students of computer science don't often think about, or maybe it's something that you see and you're a little confused about what's going on. Now this video will have code in it, and of course, as always, that code is available through Patreon. But first, let's talk a little bit about abstraction. So abstraction is a really simple idea. It's basically the idea that we want to hide or abstract away inner implementation details in order to make cleaner, easier to manage interfaces between program components. So here's an example. Say I'm writing an audio processing program and I create a module that reads in audio files in a certain format, let's say WAV files, and provides the waveform data from the file to the rest of the program. Okay, this module is doing a lot of file operations and format parsing. And if, I, if it were something other than WAV format, it might be handling compression, I mean, decompression, you get what I'm saying. But the point is, is that the rest of my program doesn't really care about the details. They don't really care about what happens inside this module. The rest of my program just doesn't care about the details. It just cares that it can put in a file name, file name to a WAV file, and it's going to get back the audio data if that file exists. And if I do a good job of keeping it self-contained and hiding the inner details and only allowing access to its functionality through a select group of functions, then this allows me to do two important things. One one, I can change those inner workings at any time. And the rest of my program doesn't have to change. It doesn't even have to know that anything changed. And as your projects get bigger and more complex, this becomes a huge advantage. And two, it makes it much easier for me to take this module that I've created and copy it over to another project and reuse that code, either in the form of a library or by just copying the source code over. And this is such a common thing in programming and computer science that a lot of languages, especially your object-oriented languages, actually build mechanisms right into the language for hiding information. For example, if you use Java or C++, your classes can have private data members. The whole point of this is to hide the inner workings, the details, to restrict outside components and only allow them to access the public members. But students sometimes wonder if you can do the same thing in C, which is not an object-oriented language, and doesn't have a private keyword. So today I want to talk about one way that you can do this using opaque data types. Now you have probably all used opaque data types before when you open and close files. You just might not have realized it. When you call the fopen function, you give it a file name and a mode, read, write, or append, and it returns a file pointer. And then you use that file pointer when you call fwrite and fread and fprintf, and finally, when you call fclose to close the file. But what is this file pointer? It's a pointer to something clearly, probably a struct, but what are its members? What is going on inside? We don't know. The type is opaque. Yes, you could dig into the libc source code and you could try to figure it out, and that's not a bad educational exercise, but this set of functions is designed to hide the details of how files are handled. We don't need to know what's going inside. We just get a pointer to our open file and we use it whenever we need. And that's great because it allows the underlying system to implement files in different ways. I mean, maybe the most efficient way to implement fopen depends on your operating system. Maybe it depends on your processor. And this nice abstraction allows me to implement this struct and these functions in any way that I like internally and I don't have to care as long as I get the data that I want from my files. So let's take a look at how you could do this in your own code. So let's start out with a slightly modified version of the Q example that we worked on in a recent video. I'll link down below in the description if you missed it and you wanna check it out. So the main changes that I've made since that video is I changed the names a bit to make them a little more consistent and a little shorter. I also made this creation function so that it returns a pointer to a queue rather than taking it in as an argument, because that's gonna make our example today a little more straightforward. And I modified this queue destroy function down here so that it not only frees the arguments, but frees the queue itself, because basically I am mallocing space for this queue when you call queue create. So this is just making sure we don't end up with memory leaks and we're cleaning up the stuff that we're allocating. But otherwise, this code is basically the same as you saw before in that previous video, okay? now in 
this code and in that video, I just put everything in the same source file. You can see that all of my queue functions are up here and I have my main function that actually uses the queue down here because in that video, my goal was to, as simply as possible, show you how the queue implementation works. But if we're talking about abstracting away data types, I didn't do a very good job of doing that because I, I just really didn't abstract the details away from this user. If I'm the user of this queue, all of the details are right up here. They're all right in front of me. And while I did only call the prescribed functions down below, there's nothing but my common sense that prevents my main function from directly accessing the elements inside my queue, like my head, my tail, my num entries, or size. And that's the sort of thing that a good abstraction or abstract data type would like to prevent. So let's see what we can do with it. I'm going to leave my original version here in this orig directory. That's fine. I've made this abstracted directory over here. Let's just copy the code over, but I'm going to break it up into a few different files. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to make is I'm going to make a header file. We'll call this myq.h. Let's also create a .c file, same name, and let's make a qtest.c that's going to actually test out my queue and see if it actually works. Okay, so if we're coming back to my original example, um, I'm going to take my main function here and we're going to copy that and we're going to put that in QTest and we're probably going to need some header files up here. Let's see what we had over here. We'll just copy these over for now. I may not need all of them. Probably don't need limits. That's cool. And let's also include our myq.h file because that's gonna have the information about our queue. Then we're gonna need that in this in this function. Now, the bulk of my queue functions down here, these guys I'm going to put in my .c file. Let's just copy this all. We're gonna copy them all over into my queue.c. Okay, we're also going to need to include my queue.h. That's going to tell them where it is. Now you notice I've got a bunch of squiggly lines here because it's saying, I don't know what queue is, I don't know what queue is. And so let's jump back down here and we will actually define what our queue is along with this little pound define up here in my queue.h. I'm also going to add some if def guards, my queue.h. And if you've never seen if def guards before, I do have a video on that. I will link down in the description. It's just basically to prevent any multiple includes if there are multiple different parts of my program that want to actually utilize this queue. And then the only other thing I need to do here is I need to go through and actually create prototypes for my functions in the header file because the header file is going to be the interface that I'm going to use to communicate to the outside world what they can and cannot process. So I'm just going to take all of these functions and copy them over into here, but I just want prototypes. So what I'm going to do is just cut the function bodies out of them and do this quickly here. Okay, now these are my public functions. Now when I say public function, what I mean is any function that I want to allow users of this module, users of this data structure to access outside of this translation unit. And right now all of my functions are listed as public. Let's say that there are some that I didn't want. Like maybe I don't want my users to be able to test whether my queue is empty or full. I could move these into the .c file and declare them as static. That's going to limit their scope to the current translation unit. And it's going to make it so that outside users can't call those functions. So I could do that, but in this case, it doesn't make much sense because I really do want my users to be able to test for fullness and emptiness. So we're going to leave them in here. And since all of these functions use this queue type, then of course we have the queue struct up here that allows people to create queues. And that seems like a natural place to put it. Now at this point, let's pause for a second because things are feeling a bit more abstract. I've separated these components into different files and the header file now typically represents my interface. That's the thing that tells you what you can access and what you can't, which is basically the abstraction that I want to provide the user. And let's just make sure that it actually works. So I have a make file that I created for this. There's really nothing fancy here. It just compiles these and then links them all together in a final binary. It would be helpful if I went down and went into my abstracted folder and tried to run it. Oh, my make file is looking for qtest. Here, we'll just rename this to qtest. Ah. And then let's see, okay, what did I forget? Clearly we have a few issues. We'll get those sorted out really quick. Oh yes, we've got to include standard bool up here because I'm using bools. 
Okay. One thing about when you're debugging, you always want to look at the first error that's showing up. That's really important. Okay, probably another header file here. Yes. Here, let's go back down. Just grab these guys for time's sake. And I'm probably also going to need to move this into my header file because you notice I use int min right here. The whole purpose of having this limits.h is because that's where int min is defined. So now we compile, we're just fine, and we can run our Q test function in our program. And you can see that our Q is working just fine. We've just separated things out a bit. Now this works and it's definitely a step in the right direction because now if you wanna see the inner workings, you have to actually like look into the program. But if we look back in the header file, this Q type right here is still kind of exposing its inner workings. It's really not opaque. You can tell exactly everything that's in there. And our main function over here in Q test could actually, it's not currently, but I could just say something like Q1 head equals seven. I mean, it would be a really bad idea to do it, but I could, there's nothing that prevents that. I could totally do this because the inner working, the inner elements of this struct are totally exposed. And so what do we do in this case? We need to define our struct so these function definitions will compile. You know, so they need to know that a queue is a thing, but we don't want to give away the farm by telling the user what's inside the struct. And that's where opaque data types come in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my main struct definition here and move it back into my q.c. Okay, so, so now I'm moving that inside here. And actually, while I'm at it, we're just going to put it back over here. So, so I have a version in both. But what I'm going to do in the header file is remove the body of the struct. And I'm going to have to actually give the struct a name to make my syntax still work. So I'm going to say there's some, some struct called my q. Let's give it a name my q over here. This is internal. No one's actually ever going to use my q, but I'm just I'm just using it so that I can declare this type the way I want to. But so we're basically going to have this myq struct, which we're type defing to be a q. So basically back here in the header file, I'm going to type def struct myq to be q. Okay. Now this tells the compiler that q is really just some sort of struct called myq. And to anyone who's using this q, the compiler will treat q as an incomplete type, meaning that we know it's a type, we just don't know the details except that it's a struct. And now at this point, Q is what I would call an opaque data type. It's defined incompletely, and so users can't just access what's inside the struct. I mean, they could. There are some sneaky ways with casting and point arithmetic. They could still access the memory, the elements inside the struct, but we shouldn't, and we won't. And that sort of thing could be done with private class elements in C++ as well. So I guess the point of what we're doing is this, it becomes a deterrent. It becomes more complicated to do the wrong thing. So Really, by doing this, we're saying, hey, these are not the elements you're looking for. You don't get to play with what's inside this struct. You don't need to look behind the curtain. Just use the queue, okay? And this will work, even though it may seem a little bit strange. Now, some of you may be wondering why the compiler lets us do this. And you know, we haven't actually specified the type. And it's a good question. There's not a lot you can do with an incomplete type. You can't access its elements. You don't even know how big it is. But you'll notice that these functions in our header file don't ask for a queue. They ask for a Q pointer, a pointer to a Q. And a pointer is just an address. So the compiler knows what to do with an address. It knows what to do with a pointer, just as long as you don't try to dereference that pointer. So this allows our users to call our functions and store pointers to queues, but doesn't allow them to come down in main and do stuff like Q1 head equals 45. If I try to do that, you notice it's going to give me a problem. It's going to say a pointer to an incomplete class type is not allowed. But just so you can see that this actually does work I can still compile it. Everything is fine so long as I don't try to access those inner members and my Q test program still works just as it did before. So that's one more way that you can make your code more abstract. You can make your data types more abstract without switching over to something like C++ or Java, basically without having to switch languages. Because sometimes you don't want to switch languages, but you still want to be able to limit the scope of your data types in order to maintain better abstractions and keep things more modular and easier to maintain in the future. I hope this is useful. That testing video is coming up hopefully next week. Subscribe if you don't want to miss that or the video that comes after that. And until next week, I'll see you later.